before you start recording, make sure you know what your organization is doing by recording this. And I promise we will not make bootlegs of this. Um, okay. I mean, you so, can if you want. <laughs> right. Yes. Free and, and I guess my stuff free and worth every penny. Uh, so the, just uh, as as an opening, folks, thank you so much for, for coming back, whatever asynchronous or synchronous time you'd, you'd like to join the Embodied Interaction Seminary. We're absolutely thrilled uh, today. And I mean that. You hear that a lot of stuff, but it's like, oh, I've been so looking forward to hearing from Dana because we haven't met personally yet, but I've learned of Dana's work through Eric Heckler, who's an Embodied Interaction tuning fan and uh, re co-researcher and all the rest of that good stuff, who's been a huge fan and recommender of your work, Dana, for years. And in particular, the fact that, Dana, you're taking on board um, something that is very, very challenging to do in the professional context of, of engaging with medical devices, which we'll hear about, which is which brings up this wonderful tension that we're very interested in in this community around who gets to say what happens under the hood, in the skin, and who who owns these processes, who owns this data, the whole shooting match. And that's why, not least, you're, you're so inspiring for the help you brought to many, many people to get in there themselves. And as a question I asked you initially is like, how, how do you know when you know enough to have the confidence to start this kind of, some people might call it self-hacking, but it sounds a lot more principled to me than just getting out a, a Bluetooth device and going, let's see what happens when I when I do this to myself. And especially because you are treating yourself very seriously. So with without further ado, really, um, Please, please share as much about yourself for context as you wish beyond that. Uh, and o over to you, Dana, pleasure to thank you for being here with us. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm very comfortable with the asynchronous conversation. So for those who end up watching this not live, please feel free to ask questions in Slack after this in between the sessions, but following this as well. I'm going to share my screen, which you should be able to see here shortly. And if that looks good, I will. Yep. Yep get started. Um, I'm going to turn mine off. Perfect. So when we talk about healthcare, I think it's important to remember that people are patients. Um, when we talk about healthcare and we talk about it from a professional setting, it can be really easy to almost look at it too abstractly. And so when I always start to talk about my story and my journey, I often want to kind of help personalize it. And it's not as easy as just saying, I have type 1 diabetes, but I think it's important to recognize what happens when somebody is diagnosed with a chronic disease or a condition and then something happens. And I use the analogy that it's like being struck by lightning. For example, you have no way to know that it's coming in most cases, and you just have to deal with the after effects. But most people don't have a lightning strike preparedness plan. They might have a preparedness plan to deal with earthquakes, wildfires, tsunamis, you know, depending on your geography, you might have one of those plans and you kind of kind of know what to do or not. But when you're diagnosed with a chronic disease, there's a very clear before and after where you didn't realize that what was the old normal was your before. And now you have this new normal or new after that you have to deal with. But unfortunately, in the last two years, probably all of us have experienced something that kind of gives you a better feel for what people with chronic diseases deal with in that transition from before to after. And if you haven't guessed, that's the COVID-19 pandemic. For the last two years, many of us have had to change our behaviors. We've had to think about social distancing, possibly vaccines, wearing masks, changing the way that we work, the way we recreate, the way we just hang out with friends and family. It's been a really, really big shift. And there's a lot of people who talk about oh, you know, the before times or the old normal and the new normal. And a lot of the language we use to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic, I think if you can take that on, that kind of helps you understand the mindset of somebody who gets diagnosed with a chronic disease and has to learn how to do things differently. And that's what I had to do personally myself over 19 years ago when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 14. And I had had the stereotypical symptoms of type 1 diabetes, so I kind of knew something was wrong, but I didn't have anybody in my family with type 1 diabetes, so I didn't know it was coming. And the moment I was diagnosed, it felt like a lightning strike of 
gosh, this is an incurable disease that requires 24-7, 365 management for the rest of my life. And I remember after I kind of got adjusted, the first few months I didn't tell anybody because I didn't want to be labeled. Diabetes has a lot of stigma, whether it's type 1 or type 2, and different countries have different levels of stigma, and it's very unfortunate. So as a teenager, I wanted to just go back to school and be completely normal as my old normal, but taking care of myself. But I didn't really talk about it. And later on, I eventually got comfortable and would tell friends and you know the people I was dating that I had type 1 diabetes And I remember at one point, my then boyfriend that I was dating made a comment like, what's the big deal? It's just a shot, right? And his perception of diabetes was that it was just a shot. And I think a lot of people don't understand how hard diabetes is. And people with diabetes, yes, we have to take shots or get insulin into our body through an insulin pump or otherwise, but it's more complicated than that. For example, we're told to quote unquote, eat right where there's not one perfect universal diet. Science is constantly disagreeing on what is the right diet, and that's for general populations. It's not individualized. And you can eat the same thing every single day and get different results eating the exact same thing. It's very frustrating. And the same thing with exercise. You can exercise, and sometimes, depending on the situation and the type of exercise, your blood sugar can go up. Other times, it can go down. Sometimes there'll be no change. And then after you're done, your blood sugar will go up or down. So these things you would think are kind of easy to control, right? Eat right, exercise, it's that simple. Well, it's not if you're getting different results, even if you do the same thing every single time. And the challenging thing too, with the medication of insulin for type one diabetes or other insulin requiring diabetes types is it's not instantaneous. So if you inject insulin or press a button on my insulin pump, insulin goes into my body But the peak activity time on the insulin doesn't really peak for about an hour. And then it lasts in the the body overall for five, six, seven hours. And so in three hours, if I have to make another decision about what to do, I have to take into account not just what I'm eating or exercising right then, but also insulin activity and food choices that I made hours ago. So there's these constant rolling windows of decision making with very complex variables that I have to do. And for the longest time, kind of the gold standard measurement was what's called the A1C or HbA1c, which is a blood stick or you know blood draw value that kind of tells you what your blood sugar has been on average for the last three months. And so you would go to the doctor, get your blood draw, your blood stick, you would get back this result, and that would be used as kind of a guidepost of how are you doing. But remember, on a daily basis, you're making hundreds of decisions a day, looking back at what you've done and thinking about what you're moving forward. And then as a patient, you go to the doctor and you're given one single measurement that's thumbs up or thumbs down, you're doing everything you should or not, but it's often very disaligned from what you're actually doing. And it's really frustrating because if you think about it, you know, one single measurement reflecting thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of decisions over the last three months, it's really unuseful. It's like being a pilot, being a commercial pilot and flying multiple flights a day all month and then getting back one single metric that says, yeah, you're doing okay or not. Well, if you're not doing okay, what do you take from that information about how you do things differently, how you get better outcomes? It's really, really hard. So thankfully with diabetes, we have additional tools now that do give us additional metrics. One of these tools is the continuous glucose monitor. Whereas before, people with diabetes would have to manually finger stick and get their blood sugar reading as many times as they could afford it and are willing to do. For me, at my peak of finger stick monitoring, I was testing my blood sugar manually 12 to 14 times per day. And that was a lot to do. And it was the best I could do. And it was way more than what most people typically do on average. But it still wasn't good enough because I was only getting like, 12 insights a day into what was happening, but it didn't help me what happened before that blood sugar test or what was happening after. So the beautiful thing with a continuous glucose monitor is you get a real-time reading every five minutes from the sensor on your body that gives you a sense of what your blood glucose is. And you can see it in a graph on a picture of what your blood sugar has been. And then you can kind of start to mentally fill in the picture of what your blood sugar is going to be doing. So that way, when you start to think about the information about the insulin timing, what you're eating, exercise, it starts to make it a little bit easier to then guess about where your blood sugar is going. 
So on this graph, the red dots measure, kind of show what would happen if you were just finger stick blood glucose testing, whereas the line is what you would get with a CGM. So if you were just looking at the red dots, you would say, okay, your blood sugar's in range and your blood sugar's a little bit above range. Well, if you look at the CGM, you can see that there's above and below range and a lot of swings in between those two dots. So if you were just to, in your mind, extrapolate a line between those two dots, you would get a completely different story than what was actually happening. And then of course, as a person with diabetes, I talked a little bit about the challenges of food and exercise and the timing of insulin, but there's also other things going on in your body all the time that you have no control over and you can't measure. Things like, are you sick? You know, have you gotten a cold from somebody? Do you have COVID-19? Any other sickness? But then you also have regular hormones, whether you're dealing with a menstrual cycle or growth spurts or other hormonal changes and also things like stress. And this is not just, you know, really, really peak. I'm the most stressed I've ever been in my stress life, but things like how much you've slept, how hydrated you are and little changes like that, that are not necessarily what people think about are stress, but little stressors to the body can influence your blood glucose levels. So I always struggled as a person with type one diabetes because of all of these variables, some of which I could measure, some of which I could try to control and manage, but it felt like I was doing a hundred things and getting a result, that A1C, that didn't really connect with what I was doing. And it was really hard to figure out what should I do differently? What should I do next? Again, because of kind of that separation. And the other problem I had as a person with diabetes was I lived by myself. And although I was fortunate enough to have access to insulin, have an insulin pump and have a continuous glucose monitor, the pump and the CGM didn't talk to each other. So I was responsible for looking at the CGM seeing what my blood sugar was, guessing about what it would be doing next, and then making changes to my insulin pump to give myself more or less insulin. And so I had to look at the CGM in order to make any changes. And that meant that I had to be awake and looking at the screen to know what my blood sugar was. And this system was designed with alarms, but because I'd had diabetes for so long, because I was getting alarms all the time, my brain started to develop what we call alarm fatigue. And so overnight, even if the alarm was going off constantly, I would just sleep through it. And so as a quote unquote good patient, I reached out to the companies and said, I have this problem, I can't hear the alarm. Can you make the alarm so that I can change it? You know, put two or three different sounds on the receiver so I can change it periodically so my brain won't get used to it. Can we make a louder alarm? And the answer was always, that's not really a problem for anybody. And maybe you should get a roommate and we're working on it, it'll be out in the next commercial version, which always means five or more years away. And I always felt really frustrated that same day because the people working at the companies could go home and go to sleep without fear. But every single night, I was afraid of dying in my sleep from a low blood sugar and not waking up in time to do something about it since I lived alone. And I thought, you know, if only I could get my data from the physical receiver of the CGM, this is before CGMs talk to phones, you know, I could send it to the cloud down on my phone and come up with some way to make a louder alarm on my phone that I could constantly change to do all the things that I wanted. Well, that required accessing your own data. And back in 2013, this was hard. And today in 2021, it is still really hard to access your own data through your own way and get it to the places that you wanna go. But what was particularly ironic about in 2013 is the only approved way to get your data off of your physical device was to plug it in to a PC computer and use the approved software to upload a 30 day dump retrospectively to the laptop. Well, I had a Mac, so there was no FDA approved software for me to even access my data on my computer in retrospect, let alone to be able to do it in real time and build the system that I wanted to. And I kind of left it as it was and was just frustrated by the inability to get my data off. And in fact, this picture is what I showed with my doctor when he asked for access to my data. Because again, I didn't have a PC, I couldn't just plug it in and pull the data off. So I would take a picture of my CGM screen every day, email it to myself, copy and paste it into Excel. And this is what I printed out and handed to my doctor because it was the only way to give the data to him. And he couldn't do anything with this because looking at this, what do you do? You were high, you were low. Why were you high? Why were you low? There's no information about insulin. There's no information about anything else. It was really unuseful. But I use this picture to illustrate how hard it was for me who own the device. It's my data. I'm physically holding the device in my hand. But again, I had to be awake, press the button and look at the screen in order to see the data. 
So eventually I grew frustrated with being told that I was the only one with the problem of not hearing alarms and that they were working on it. Again, typically when you hear a company is working on something, especially in medical device hardware, that's a three to five year out thing. And in the meantime, every single night, I had that problem and I didn't wanna wait three years or five years or however long. So I realized that I would need to build my own tools. But for context, my background, I was in health communications, not a programmer, not an engineer, but I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So in 2013, I saw a tweet from a gentleman named John Kostick, who had a son with type one diabetes who had the same CGM receiver I did. And he figured out a way to pull the CGM data off in real time and upload it to the cloud so that he could then remotely monitor his son when he went off to kindergarten. And I didn't need somebody to remotely monitor me, but I wanted the ability to, again, to pull the data off, send it to the cloud, down to my phone, and make a louder alarm. And that's essentially what I was able to do. I reached out to him and said, hey, I wanna do this thing, it's not your thing, but your ability to get the CGM data off is something that I need and I could use. Would you share it with me? And he said yes. And that was my first exposure to this concept of open source and people sharing, especially sharing code to help other people achieve things that they wanted to achieve in terms of health-related projects like this. And so because I was able to get my CGM data off my device into the cloud and down to my phone and make a louder alarm, I was able to do additional things. I built a display page, really basic, ugly web page that would show the data from my CGM in one place. And then I added buttons so I could actually say, here's what I'm eating, here's the insulin that I've taken. So all in one place, I had blood sugar, insulin, and the carbohydrate information of what I was eating. And once I had all that data in place, I realized that I could just plug in those activity curves and the timing of the insulin to be able to not only say, here's what my blood sugar is right now, therefore alarm if it's in or out of range, but also predict into the future what the blood sugar is likely to be given the food, given the insulin timing, given the changes in blood sugar. And then I was able to add proactive alarms and alerts. So instead of just saying your blood sugar is high, your blood sugar is low, take action. It would say, okay, in 47 minutes, you're likely to go low, eat six grams of carbs. And that was really, really powerful, even though this was an open loop system, because instead of me as the human having to look at the CGM, having to look at the pump and think about my insulin dosing and what I was eating and the timing of insulin and what I did the last you know, five to six hours, every single time I wanted to make a decision, this system looked at all of those variables, did all the math based on the rules that I gave it and gave me a quick answer. And in this screenshot, you can see no action needed because I'm predicted to be in range. But anytime I was predicted to be out of range, it would generate an alarm and tell me, here's what to do, more insulin, less insulin, or eat something. And it was really powerful, even in that open loop scenario, because the person with type one diabetes or insulin requiring diabetes does so much work on a regular basis. So to start to answer MC's question about, you know, why would somebody do this? And how do you know that you know enough? The same rules I taught the computer are actually what I taught my boyfriend, now husband at the time. And that's what made us realize we could teach a computer. Because if I could teach another person, which you very easily can, the rules that every person with diabetes learns and has to know in order to administer insulin to themselves, a computer can follow those rules based on the prediction of what the blood sugar is going to be and the safety settings that you get it. So the beautiful thing about this is with a person with diabetes without these tools has to be in the middle of the pump in the CGM or their injections in a finger stick blood glucose monitor and be thinking constantly about what's been happening, what to do and do it over and over again. But with this, we were able to take all of that data and put a computer in the middle. So it could pull in the data from the CGM about what my blood glucose had been. And every five minutes when it had a new data point, it would update the math and it would read from the insulin pump to decide what to do. And it could think every five minutes, every time I got a new data point, what to do. And previously we had that sending commands and alerts to me as the human. So that's what we called an open loop. But we also realized within a year that it was possible to also write to the insulin pump and send commands back to the insulin pump. So instead of telling me as the human, take more insulin, take less insulin, it could send those commands automatically to the pump. And that's what enabled us to build what we call the closed loop. Again, we didn't set out to create a quote unquote artificial pancreas or hack the pump or you know do any of that. 
that was the end product of solving the first problem I had of wanting to get access to my data in real time so I could make a louder alarm. Once I had a louder alarm, we were able to also build in predictions. Once we had predictions, we were able to build an open loop alert system. And then closing the loop, that last bit of translating those pumps back, those commands back to the pump was relatively easy. And that's what we were able to do. So the system would give more or less insulin. It was still designed with all of these amazing alerts so that if I was predicted to go out of range and the system couldn't handle it, it would alert me. If I needed to eat something, it would tell me what to do. But I went from having dozens of alarms every single night to having so few alarms that years later, I now do wake up to the alarms, the basic alarms on the devices, because I don't have alarm fatigue anymore. But that's the beautiful thing, is we were able to solve one problem at a time and use the existing architecture of diabetes management knowledge. We're not doing anything wild and crazy. That's the same insulin pump I had before, the same continuous glucose monitor that I had before. Those are FDA approved software. And the difference is I took a little mini computer, that little green piece right there, and added those rules to it and had it talk to the pump in the CGM and pull that piece all together. And that wasn't anything wild and crazy to the diabetes world either. There had been companies and researchers working on closed loop automated insulin delivery systems for years. They just hadn't come to market yet. And so people told me, you should wait, there will be something out. Again, two to three years uh, or five years was the prediction. And in fact, the first commercial system came out two and a half years after I had been using my system. And so I always said, I'm not trying to create a company. We did not create a company. We made this all open source. We shared it openly. And this was really me saying, I'm going to use this until there's something available commercially that I want to use. And I kind of expected that the first commercial system would be better than what I could build as a patient. And that once it became available and if my insurance covered, I'd switch to it. Well, the first version eventually came out and it wasn't quite doing everything that my system could do because we were able to continually improve the algorithm, improve the usability, do different things like display your data on your watch or display your data on your phone. Whereas with the commercial system, it was all on the pump. You couldn't see it in real time. And so some of the same challenges from 2013 still exist in 2018 and then 2021 with the inability to see your data. And that was really frustrating. And so I actually kept using and I'm still using my open source solution today because it works really, really well. If you remember some of the graphs I showed you before when I was talking about the challenges of data access, this is what a good week looked like for me when I was trying my hardest because I knew my doctor would be looking at my data. High blood sugar when I crossed the yellow line, low blood sugar crossing the red line, up and down and up and down. Well, within the first week of using my open source, hacked, DIY, done by a patient, all these derogatory connotation words, this is what my results were straight line, straight line, straight line. And this again was a really basic algorithm using the same rules every, every person with diabetes does in their head. But the difference is it's making small changes every five minutes. It's making these predictions with the insulin activity curve, you know, copiously mapped out. And so the computer does a much better job than we humans at managing insulin delivery, especially on a continuous basis. And what I find interesting is it's now been seven years since I closed the loop and it's been awesome. I've used it every single day. It works really, really well. But as we've started to talk about automated insulin delivery, both open source and commercial, it's been really interesting at the pushback that people with diabetes get, not really only from inside the diabetes community, but more often we get bigger pushback from outside the diabetes community where people who don't understand the risk and the challenges of dosing insulin manually or through a pump, they don't understand how hard it is to get everything right. Remember, we're talking about food doing different things, exercise doing different things, insulin working on different time scales, sickness, hormones, stress. There's all this stuff that goes in that we can't measure and we can't manage and you just kind of have to deal with the results. Well, clearly from the pictures on the screen, and I'll talk about evidence later, this works really, really well, this idea of automated insulin delivery. But most people, when they think about automated insulin delivery or adding a computer, or adding AI, this isn't AI, this isn't machine learning, but this is the kind of argument that comes up. People say, oh my gosh, you're at increased risk of using this technology to help you manage your diabetes. But the flaw with this is they're comparing a person with insulin requiring diabetes using this technology, which yes, there is some added risk, but they're comparing it to you 
a person without insulin requiring diabetes. And that's completely wrong because the reality is that a person with insulin requiring diabetes with manual insulin dosing is at significantly increased risk compared to the person without diabetes, especially if they're manually ins dosing their insulin. It is very, very easy to make a small fractional visible error and get really bad results. And you can also do it exactly right and get really not great results. That's how challenging diabetes is. So what we have to do when we're talking about the risk of adding technology is look at the actual situation we're talking about, which is comparing person with insulin requiring diabetes with and without this technology, and look at the fact that this technology actually significantly reduces most of the risk of manual error, which is the most common error in insulin dosing. And so yes, there's increased risk from technology, but significantly overall net risk reduction from using automated insulin delivery. And this is true of commercial systems. This is true of the open source systems created by patients. And so that's one thing that I've really advocated for in the broader healthcare community to look at is when we're talking about patient-driven innovation or people hacking, these people, and I can say this from experience, I know my body. I care about safety. I care about safety more than anybody else on this planet, which is why I built the system and why I use it every day because it works for me. If it wasn't safe, if it didn't work, I would have stopped using it, but it still really, really works. But in healthcare, we have traditional ways that knowledge is disseminated and technology, it comes to market. And this idea of open source patient built innovation that's not through companies, not through the traditional methods, is just something that healthcare has struggled with. And so diabetes and open APS and this open source automated insulin delivery is one of the first concepts that people hear about because we've done a pretty good job telling our story inside and outside of the healthcare communities. But the reality is healthcare has this bigger problem of when there is new information and it comes from different places, healthcare is like, well, it's not been proven. It's not been, you know, whatever, whatever. There's all these objections and it can be really, really frustrating. And it's not unique to diabetes, but healthcare has this not invented here cultural problem where if it wasn't developed by the right person at the right university, at the right company through the right system, that knowledge doesn't get disseminated or it takes a really, really long time. And one of my favorite stories to kind of illustrate how knowledge sometimes is pushed back against within the healthcare system, even against people with the right credentials, is the story of the treatment of celiac disease. I, type 1 diabetes has like a 10% link with celiac disease, which I also have. And with celiac disease, it means I can't eat anything with wheat, gluten, rice, barley. Um, and that, I was diagnosed in 2012, and I just took that for granted, that this is the treatment for celiac disease. This has always been what happened. But reality is, back in the early time when celiac disease was first discovered, there was a doctor in Italy that found that, okay, when I just have my patients eat bananas, they do better. They stop dying. They stop wasting away. And so the treatment for celiac disease, especially in the early 1900s, was eat a giant bush, bunch of bananas every single day, nothing else. And people survived, but I don't think it would be very fun to eat just bananas all day, every day for the rest of your life. And so eventually, somebody during World War II realized that the prevalence of people dying with celiac disease went down because there was no bread in these countries due to the war restrictions and access issues. And so, hey, maybe bread is the issue. And they, they figured out it was wheat and then realized it was gluten. And so people stop eating gluten, they do better. And you could do a modern, normal diet, gluten-free, that doesn't mean just eat bananas. But the reason I tell this story, and especially in concert to diabetes and talking about diabetes technology, is the person who discovered that and was a big proponent of that was a doctor. But the doctor who came up with the bananas thing was so convinced that bananas are the answer, you know, bananas are the cure, not just looking at the absence of everything else is what made people better. And so I think in healthcare, there's this tendency to say, okay, well, people aren't dying, you know, or people are, you know, aren't having these terrible outcomes, so it's okay. But the reality is just because something's working-ish doesn't mean it's okay. Again, when you looked at my early numbers of my blood sugar graphs that were up, down, up, down all the time, I was getting okay clinical results on average, but I was suffering. When my blood sugar was high and low, I felt it. I had physical symptoms, I had psychological symptoms, and I was doing all this work that I didn't have to do. And so I think it's really important when we think about 
all of this knowledge or this idea of hacking or building a new knowledge is recognizing that the way things are, the status quo, it's not necessarily the only solution. It's not the best solution. And it doesn't mean that that's what pe people would willingly choose because it's not just about clinical outcomes, but we also have to think about the quality of life for people living with these conditions and deciding what to do. And honestly, most of the time when I hear stories of people who are hacking or whatever, it's not people who are just hacking for fun. That happens outside of healthcare a lot. But for the most part, the stories in healthcare are for people like me who said, living with this condition for a long time, very deep knowledge. I have one particular small problem that I want to solve. It's not going to cure me, but it will drastically improve my quality of life. That's what I did with the louder alarm. And then I was able to build on subsequent solutions. And that's what happens to other people too, who deeply understand the condition that they're living with. You can hear it about the you know, the viral TikTok video from the athlete with Parkinson's disease who struggled to open their bottle tops. And so there was this big story outside of the healthcare world about, wow, you know, people worked with this patient with Parkinson's and built a better pill bottle opener or pill bottle cap or whatever. But that was because somebody deeply understood their condition, their problem. And it was a relatively small change, but it became this big viral story. And we really need to think about, okay, there's tons of solutions out there but how can we scale this knowledge? And that's a pushback I got after I first closed the loop and it worked really well for me. People said, it works well for you, but how do you know it's gonna work for anybody else? And so I'll get this in, into this in way more detail in my second seminar, but I just wanna point out that we didn't know. The point of this wasn't to create a solution that works for everybody. This was about creating a solution that worked well for me based on my really deep knowledge of my situation shared it openly in case it would help anybody else. And then another person, another person, another person used it. And then we've gotten now to thousands of people using open source automated insulin delivery worldwide. We estimate that there's at least 40 million hours of experience with this technology. And because we were questioned about it, we decided to do a survey, presented at a scientific conference, and we got accepted just like traditional scientists. We then got invited to submit to a peer-reviewed journal, which we did, and we got our article accepted and peer-reviewed just like traditional scientists. And I realized there was no barrier for me as a patient to also disseminating knowledge that way. So not just doing blogs and social media and reaching the patient community, but also educating the healthcare provider and the researcher community and trying to find a way to go top down and bottom up with that knowledge. And so again, I will talk about this a lot more detail in the next seminar, but I just wanna point out, if you wanna do some initial reading on open APS, there's a lot of literature out there. And if you ever see any of my articles, I'm happy to send you uh, copies of them. But now Open APS is an example that's frequently mentioned in many articles when you're talking about internet of things or patient innovation. It's one of the really, really prominent examples, as well as it's been studied in and of itself really, really well, both by us, we started that research train, but also it it's starting to be compared directly to commercial automated insulin delivery because it's so good in and of itself. And so as a patient, as somebody who built this stuff, it's really frustrating when the traditional healthcare world or professionals from any genre come in and say, well, you're not an engineer. How did you do this? Or you're not a doctor. How dare you think about, you know, doing something better for yourself? And what I think it's important to recognize is that patients are going to create or DIY or hack whatever language you want to use because there is a broken system that's failed them. It has not met their needs. It's not solving these problems. Healthcare looks at problems like mine and says, sleeping through your alarms, Psh, that's, just, that's just you, Dana, get a roommate. Well, if you Google louder CGM alarm, I can't remember what the results are now, but there's you know tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of results for louder CGM alarm. And you can look at different chat logs and transcripts and web forums and see over a decade of people saying, how do I make the CGM alarm louder? So if you do the market research, the needs are there, but traditionally healthcare companies haven't been prioritizing that for whatever reason. And I think that's something that we need to change in healthcare because healthcare traditionally designs data and systems and features for the company, then for providers. And like, yeah, it's a patient device, but patients don't need access to their data. They definitely don't need it in real time. That's what happened in diabetes. And so we need to flip this around and make sure that we design for patients first and then providers and then the companies, but make data and features available to patients. Even if it's something that companies don't know that patients wanna do, 
there's so many wonderful things we can do with diabetes data when we get access to our data, but we shouldn't have to jump through hoops and DIY in order to get real-time data access. But companies and the regulators think that there's a risk for people with diabetes accessing their own data. Well, this conversation has been going on since like the 1970s when blood glucose meters were first created. They were used at hospitals and there was actually a push by doctors to restrict patients from testing their blood sugar at home when these things first came out because patients might do something with the blood sugar information and they might treat themselves wrong. That's bizarre, right? Now finger stick blood glucose testing, thankfully, when I was diagnosed in 2002, I immediately got a meter and started testing at home. But the same argument happened when CGMs, continuous glucose monitors came out. Patients shouldn't see this data. It should be blinded from the patient and only revealed retrospectively because they might do something with the data. That was the 2000 and 2010s with CGM. Now it's common for people to see their data, but only on the approved app or device that the company makes. This idea of being able to also see it on my watch, Pebble Watch or an Apple Watch or whatever you want to do, there's only very limited paths where you can get access to your data in real time, which is very, very frustrating as a patient who has ideas about, oh, if I could get my data in this method, I could do this cool new thing with it. Well, all of this was restricted until you found a way to get your own data. And it's honestly easier to get my data to the cloud around the world and back to a separate device than it is across the room from the same physical device because the data is restricted so much in the name of security and privacy and everything else. But it's also restricted in the name of in healthcare, patients might do something with this information and they might get it wrong. Well, again, really frustrating, especially in the diabetes context because people with insulin requiring diabetes, you're given a vial of the lethal drug the day you're diagnosed and you're sent home and good luck, right? And the, the right amount could give you the good outcomes the right amount could give you the wrong outcomes and the wrong amount could also potentially kill you. Like this is a lethal and life-saving drug and we're expected to do it with basically our hands tied behind our back with limited access to data, even when we own the devices and we paid for the software and everything. It's really, really frustrating. And so oftentimes when you think about patient innovation, you think about hacking, you think about people working outside of healthcare to solve healthcare problems, People say, oh, that's a one-off. That's just Dana. It probably just works for her. You know, that's 1% of people. Well, we're coming to realize, like with COVID, 1% of people, everybody everywhere with COVID is a really big number. And the same is true of any other condition. That 1% might actually be a bigger group than you expect. And also the 1% who are beating down doors and pushing through barriers and doing everything they can to make themselves heard to say this is a problem, the 1% of these patient groups might not be exceptions. They might actually be the undiscovered rule, undiscovered by the traditional healthcare system that has not bothered to listen or prioritize the vocalized needs of patients. So when we talk about hacking, I actually dislike the word hacking in context of open APS and diabetes because we didn't hack anything. I'm using my FDA-approved insulin pump the way it was designed. I'm using a commercial FDA-approved continuous glucose monitor the way it was designed. The difference is, is I'm using an algorithm on a separate device to make the two talk together um, because they are not designed to talk to each other. And so I took the communications and ported it elsewhere and did that. And so it's not hacking. It's basically taking these devices and making them even better, but I'm still using them per design, per FDA regulations and everything. Um, so there is some actual hacking of devices, but my story is not one of hacking devices. It's really, how do I take what's existing there and build on top of it and make it better? So with that, I wanna pause. I wanna take questions from anyone who happens to be live today. Again, if you have questions, you're watching this afterwards before the next one, feel free to post questions on Slack anytime. Phew, that was awesome. Um, if you wouldn't mind, <laughs> I've got lots, but uh, we do have some folks with us. And so please, oh, thank you, Seb, for the applause. I agree. Yay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah you totally. If, if you all would uh, throw your hand up if you want to ask something and, and we'll do it that way for now, just just uh, please ra raise a hand. And I can see it in the participant thing. It's the little hand sign or I will jump in. I, well, I, I, can, I can answer the question I didn't see early on. You were asking about how the prediction worked. 
And I yes. don't know if I answered that sufficiently, but essentially what the prediction does is it takes the line of the CGM of what's been happening and mm -hmm. it takes the any food that's entered in terms of grams of carbohydrates and there's mm -hmm. a dynamic carb absorption curve that we created. We have the known insulin activity curve so we can map here's when insulin is taking to effect. And then we also look at things like the rate of change of blood sugar. Um, so basically the last 15 minutes, what's been happening, not only between a single data point, the delta between point A and point B, but also that longer 15 minute window, blend all those together. And we actually make a series of predictions. We started with one prediction line, but our current system makes four predictions. Basically, if food stops working in your body and all the insulin is working, like what's the worst possible scenario that would happen? Then what if the food is working kind of as expected? And what if your current rate of blood sugar change continues regardless of those factors? And then based on that, it draws out these purple prediction lines. And then the system looks and says, first, don't, don't get hypoglycemia. Don't get a low blood sugar. So do whatever you can to restrict fat. So within a time period, if there's predicted to be a low blood sugar on any one of those lines, it's going to try to reduce the insulin to prevent that hypoglycemia from happening. And then as it does that, as time changes, it updates the prediction. So if those lines go above hypoglycemia, it might revert back to giving insulin. And then if none of them are going low, you're eventually going high, it's going to give more insulin. So it's kind of a really concerted effort of predict based on those variables, make different assessments about what might happen, and then do the safest thing possible in terms of telling the system, give more or less insulin. And my favorite anecdote about safety, I forgot to mention this during the talk, but like I said, I care most about safety and especially my safety. So I've designed the system to have a really concrete set of rules around here's the safest thing to do in all of these scenarios and all of these edge cases. Well, I think three years ago now, there was this kind of collaborative meeting consortium in DC where representatives from every blood sugar meter company, CGM, pump company came together. And I was asked to be a representative of the open source community slash the diabetes <laughs> community. I was the only patient there, it was kind of weird. And we went to this breakout room and I don't remember what the premise was, but everybody went around and was kind of like, hey, I'm person X from company Y. And this is the thing that we most care about or here's what we are worried about. And they went around and when it came to me, I said, you know, listening to y'all talk, you've designed these systems and you assume that they're going to work perfectly every time. Your blood sugar meter, your sensor, your CGM sensor, your pump. When I designed Open APS, I designed it for failure. I know that there are going to be times when my body is blocking the CGM sensor and I won't be able to get blood sugar data or my insulin pump site will fall out or, you know, the physical battery on the thing will die. But I can list, you know, offhand a dozen situations where this thing is not going to work. And so at every single time that we're making a decision, we have to assume it's the last command the system will successfully send so that if you go out of range of your system or it breaks for whatever reason, it stops working the last thing that was done was the smartest and the safest, even if nothing happens after that, right? So like we design for failure. And so these companies are designing for success, not realizing that these kind of failures, they're not a once a month thing. They're like a once or twice a week. All of these errors can happen in real life. And so designing these systems with that in mind will make you a lot safer because you're going to be making better decisions in the system. And so after that, comment and that discussion, we walked out of the room and somebody I knew from the FDA diabetes group who is really lovely, works well with patients, but she came up to me and said, this was after, I think, three or four years of her knowing us, talking with us, doing pre-submissions, reading my blog. So like all my stuff wasn't new to her, but the way I contextualized that, she walked out and said, wow, you really do think about safety. And I was like, yes, yes, I do. I think about safety better than all of you, because again, it's about me and my safety. And so I'm going to do what's best for me. And if I didn't think I could design a computer to do it better, I wouldn't be letting it do it because I do a really good job as a human, but still the computer can do it so much better. Um, so in terms of like designing those predictions and putting the safety rules in place to check against the predictions, they're so good that there's a company in France making a commercial automated insulin delivery system. They're using f fancy machine learning algorithms. Our code's open source, which means companies can use it. And to their credit, they've taken our code ported it in, tested it side by side, and found edge cases where our safety rules outperformed their system. And so what did they do? They could have just ignored that, but to their credit, they took my safety rules, these edge cases that I talked about, they added it as a safety layer. So every time their machine learning system decides what to do, it checks it against open APS safety rules. And if it disagrees, it goes back and starts over. It doesn't issue that insulin dosing command. So in this commercial system, the CEO has publicly said 10 to 20% of the time, 
it's using open APS decisions about what insulin to give, which I think is both really cool as a testament to the safety engineering of our system, but it's also a really cool example of how companies can use ideas from the patient community in a commercial regulatory approved system. Like that's, that was like better than what we could have dreamed of. Like we built the system for ourselves, hoped companies would also use it, but seeing them use it in that way, I think is like the best. And so we're thrilled to see them using it in that way. You're, um, <laughs> it's, it's wonderful to see this kind of desire to share things openly that you're talking about rather than let's find a way as quickly as possible to capitalize on it. Cause we actually really do want this to, to improve other people's quality of life. And if I may ask a question around that, maybe if you're going to talk about it uh, on the next session, that's fine. But you've mentioned we a lot. And so I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about based on taking this open approach, what are some of the examples of contributions that it's enabled to make your life safer? Because I don't think of it as, as you're concerned about your safety, you're concerned about not dying because you know you get a shot of this as a lethal injection as opposed to a health saving injection. So I'd be pretty motivated too, <laughs> uh, especially, okay, computer, go ahead, do that shot. No, Dave, uh, great. So if you could share a little bit about, like I say, how this has facilitated that kind of interaction and maybe a couple of examples, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, well, my favorite thing about this story, obviously as a person with diabetes, the first person who did it, talking about it openly, people think, okay, Dana did this. And then actually I did it in concert with my then boyfriend, now husband, he is my co-developer. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes the media is like, oh, engineering boyfriend, husband did thing for patient wife. And like, that's kind of a weird narrative because it was very much a co-develop. We did this together and we didn't do it alone. We worked with John, the first person to get the code off the CGM. We later worked with Ben West to be able to talk to the pump. Like when we did my open loop thing, we didn't realize we could close the loop. It was through talking to Ben and him saying, hey, I figured out how to talk to the pump that the light bulb went off. And we said, oh, will you help us like put this all together? Um, but one of my favorite Two favorite examples of this technology getting better through collaboration is probably after the first dozen to 20 users. Um, we had people successfully using it. We were all part of these chat platforms and we, people would talk about, you know, how can I get results like Dana? Because they're definitely better than what I had before, but they're clearly not as optimal as they could be. And so one of the situations we recognized that were really different for people was nighttime versus daytime. Nighttime, everybody was immediately getting really great results. Daytime, human behaviors get in the way, both in terms of what you're eating and how people were dosing insulin for the meal. Meal time's kind of challenging because that insulin timing that I talked about, if you eat food kicks in 15 minutes, insulin kicks in in an hour. So obviously most times you're gonna have your blood sugar start to go up before the insulin really kicks in and brings the blood sugar down. So it's hard. So for meal times, most of this technology is what's called hybrid closed loop, where they want people to manually do some insulin when you know that you're eating because the system doesn't know that you're eating, right? And so like you you wanna help, help it ahead of that timing of the insulin curve. And for some reason I was okay with dosing for my meals and still getting really great outcomes, but not everybody was. So we really recognized that meal times were something that we could tackle and improve. And so we worked with a couple of kind of end users of the community. So not engineers who were developing themselves, but really true people who found this were using it, were not technical, but we looked at their data. We looked at my data. We looked at what was I doing as a human that was so effective. And we figured out how to improve the algorithm around meal times. And so then we added that to our development branch and tested it. And we had as a ooh, advanced feature, you know, what we called advanced meal assist, you know, only turn this on, you know, like it's kind of like engineering mode for things, but like super engineering mode, advanced meal assist, like only use with caution. And then everybody was using it like from day one because it was so much better that that's now, that is the default back of the al algorithm. Just everybody gets that better advanced meal assist. But had we just used my experience and my data, we would not have improved the algorithm to do so well around meals. So that's one really cool example. We're hearing from people about where things were not working as well for them and really optimizing that turned out better. Um, so that's one good example. And the other good example is, again, came from people saying, I'm not getting as great of results. What's going on? And we learned to start asking people, when was the last time you changed your settings? Because, for example, you have these baseline settings of how much insulin you should get per hour. That's called the basal rate. And then how much insulin brings your blood sugar down. That's your ISF. And then how much insulin for X grams of carbs. Um, so that's your carb ratio. And these three basic variables are used in standalone insulin pumping. And we use that as 
the input variables to our closed loop because we wanted people to fully understand what was happening. And so you basically take those rates, you plug them into the system, and that's what's used to decide how much insulin to get based on food or the need to bring your blood sugar down, plus your targets. But a lot of people go on insulin pumps and they may or may not have touched their settings for 10 or more years. I say that because was, I was at 10 years and I hadn't changed my settings. But, okay. you know, it, your body changes, for example, from when, when I was 15 to when I was 25, body might be a little bit different. Your b- body may need different things for insulin. And so with manual insulin dosing, you can keep the same settings and with human behaviors kind of adjust and you kind of build a house of cards and you get okay results. But when you start making decisions every five minutes really precisely with those numbers, bad input, not as optimal outcomes. Like you still are getting better than before, but it's clearly not as good. But what we realized by talking to people is they're like, yeah, I haven't changed my settings, but I'm convinced my settings are right. And we're like, "Mm, I can look at your data and see it. And I can tell you, like, these are the kinds of things that need to change. But telling somebody their settings are wrong, it's really hard for most people to then take that in and go, yeah, I'm going to change my settings. Here's how much. So we ended up designing a tool that would process the person's data. They would run this privately, like we wouldn't have access to it, but they would processly run their data and it would basically chunk the data into what is attributable to that basal rate, what's attributable to the ISF and the carb ratio, look at is there enough data to decide and then make recommendations about how to change those settings. And it basically generates a report. And at first it was just generate a report and let the human decide. But again, it was so useful even for me who hadn't changed her settings in 10 years that we built it so the system will automatically do that and every single night, run this report, tweak the settings oh, cool. slightly, and use the new settings in the system. And again, this can be enabled or disabled, and it can also be run as a standalone. Um, it's called AutoTune. And what's mind-blowing is there's no user, like there's there's finally one healthcare professional version of something like this. It's not worldwide. It's not really known about endocrinologists and people for decades have been just like manually eyeballing, guessing their settings and saying like, yeah, I'll change it. Yeah, I won't. But there's no computer generated software when this is like the easiest solution in diabetes because you've got all the data on what you're eating, the insulin, the blood sugar, everything. It should be very easy to come up with multiple ways to process the data and say, make these changes. But anyways, we made our version and it worked really well because people will take a computer generated report and analyze the data and it feels way less personal. Um, So we not only got the inspiration to solve this problem of how to improve people's baseline settings, which also helped me that I wouldn't have thought I needed, but also having it show the data and show how it works and show that report and just giving it to people and it not being a personal thing. Just have you run autotune? What does your autotune say? You know, it took out that personal layer of being told that you're wrong. And I think that was also really, really helpful for people having it come from a report. Um, So that's another favorite example of, again, collaboration of how do you design something? How do you figure out it works? How do you test it with the community? Um, And then how does it get used by the community? Some things are like very one-to-one. Other things are, let's build this tool that takes out the one-to-one because it's more effective at achieving whatever the intended result is. So this French company is adding what with their AI to all of this? Like, I love that this is an example of, you know, it's it's good algorithms. It's it's not, well, AI is good algorithms too. Yes, yes. But this is just good straight ahead data analysis and some pretty hefty if-then loops and doing a remarkable job. So are they just putting all of these bits in one box or what the heck? So the the French company was already working on commercializing their system, you know, and then what they did is decided ours was really good on these edge cases of these like plain language safety rules. If the blood sugar is predicted to be low in X time, do Y. So that's actually how we wrote our algorithm was Mm -hmm. literally me telling my husband, if I go low, here is what I do. And he's like, okay, so if you go low, what do I do? And I'm like, nothing, because I've got it covered. But if you were, if you were to, if I was incapacitated and you were to do it, like if X do Y. So mm-hmm. we actually wrote our algorithm in plain language, then translated yep. it into code. And so we actually have yep. what's called the Open APS reference design that's written in plain language. Go right. to openaps.org, click reference design, and you can read it and understand as a human, here's what the algorithm is doing. And so that's what the company did is they took kind of those basic safety rules and added it as a check layer so that after the machine learning comes up with a decision of, you know, give more insulin, this is how much, it then runs that result through those safety layers. And if it dis- if my safety layers disagree, then it kicks it back out and says, okay, wait for another data point to decide what to do um, or try again, which I think is really, really cool. But one of the things that has always been very important to me with these systems is I think it's important, partially because this was DIY, but I also still have this opinion today. It's important for the human to know what the system knows yeah. 
and what it's thinking. And for example, to be able to visually see the prediction, the commercial systems on the market today, this is something I keep advocating for commercially, they don't show you a prediction. It just gives you more or less insulin. And you can kind of see, okay, it's been giving me more, more insulin, but it doesn't say, hey, we're detecting that you are resistant to your insulin right now. It doesn't say you didn't bolus for all of your food. We need to give you more to cover the meal. It doesn't tell you anything. And so kind of the human, if they get to a situation like, okay, I'm gonna go for a walk or I'm gonna go for a run or exercise or whatever, you have to look at that and kind of guess and re-piece what the commercial system has been doing to decide what you as the human need to do. And I hate that guesswork. Like that's what happened with just a CGM. You could see what your blood sugar has been doing, but then you had to kind of fill in the graph of what you think might happen in the future with your kind of quick knowledge of insulin and food and everything else. And that's why we got really bad results. So in order to get the best results, if the system is actually making predictions, you should display that to a user and teach the user, this isn't guaranteed what's gonna happen. Things change, there's things the system doesn't know about, whatever, but based on this prediction of what the system does know, here's the safest thing to do. So that way when the human does need to take action for food or exercise or whatever the system doesn't know, the human can take the, you know, do the best thing possible or say, oops, I forgot to tell the system something I can tell it. So let me fill in the gaps give it the information and let it update the prediction before I take action. So we had designed our system to be user understandable because again, that's how I thought it should be designed. But I also thought when you go to the second and third person, they don't know everything I know. And so they need to be able to look at every line of code if they want, which they can, or read the reference design, or at any point in time, you know, you could tap a button and see what is the system doing and why? You know, and it tells you, okay, we're predicting X. And because it violates the safety rule or the setting that you put in, we are going to do, you know, A, B, or C as a result. And so somebody can understand the logic of what's happening at any given time. And I think that's really important for, you know, end users to understand what's happening, whether you're the end user of an open source system or a commercial system. And so again, that's a philosophy that's not happening with commercial medical device development. Like the philosophy either from the companies or from the regulators is, oh, too much information, patients might do the quote unquote wrong thing with it, which right. that kind of infuriates me every time I hear it, but it's like, it keeps happening. It happened with blood glucose meters. It happened with CGM. It happens with AID for why they don't want these prediction lines. And they're just wrong. And it takes them 10 to 20 years to catch up to them being wrong on that and that becoming normalized. And so one of the cool things that I've seen happen is the more research we've done on open source, We've basically, and I'll talk about this in the second seminar in great detail, we've established really good outcomes, no adverse events, people keep using this stuff. Um, we get really good data, even better than some of the commercial systems, which could be for a variety of reasons. And, you know, you could kind of compare apples to apples now. And so if you start wondering why does open source get better results, um, you could argue that people are highly motivated. Mm -hmm. Yes-ish. I'm highly motivated to set up something so I do less work. So I'm actually really right. lazy. I don't want to do all this work. Um, so this the kind of the common excuse or rationale in the academic community, especially in the literature, is this is a self-selected, highly motivated population right. of patients. Yeah. And like we're motivated to do the work to solve our problems so we don't have to do stuff. So I don't think that necessarily applies. But I think there's something there about the visibility of data, the flexibility to change your targets, to set your settings how you want it. Um, again, to be able to see it on the device of your choice. And it's way different having to unhook a pump from your body, pull mm -hmm. it out, press mm -hmm. buttons to see the screen versus to be able to glance at my watch or glance at my phone. And just, it sounds really, really small. Um, but I, I heard the analogy like crawling through broken glass. It's like the constant friction. Every time you do something on a device that you really don't like, it really hampers your quality of life. Because you're like, I just don't want to do it. I don't want to input data on it. I don't want to touch it. I don't want to look at it. But if I can, I don't, if I don't like the physical device, but I can interact mostly through my phone or something else, you know, I'm going to be way more likely to give it the information and view the information, but do it in a way that doesn't just make me feel icky all the time of looking at it. And so that's why a lot of times why people will choose not to use an insulin pump or not to put something on their body like a CGM, like it just doesn't work for them. And so we have to respect that and we have to start designing for that flexibility of how can we make it work for more people? Because what gets approved through regulatory bodies is kind of what the companies and the regulars, regulators decide works for most people, works on average. But on average, doing okay doesn't mean great, doesn't mean working well. And then there's lots of people who that's just not gonna serve. And so instead of like filling in the cracks with something that people do themselves, it's like, well, you shouldn't do that. 
just suffer, just wait, we're working on it, right? It'll be out in the next version. Um, so the kind of, I've learned a lot about how companies work, how they design, how they test, how do they bring to market, what role regulators play. Sometimes it's the regulator's fault, honestly. Sometimes it's the companies that don't do the right thing and, and bring it to regulators to approve. Um, but it's kind of weird that in this design and regulatory process, there's really nobody advocating in the room for patient preference and in the patient voice. You know, you might get focus groups and you get participants in research trials, but in terms of when you get to the regulatory conversations about what the products should be doing, there's no patient voice in the room and there's no voice of kind of common sense of we can educate patients to work with the system even if it's new, right? Like we can teach people new things. We taught them how to deal with CGM and to dose insulin off of a CGM when originally you couldn't dose insulin off of a CGM. Now you can. We taught people how to do that safely. We can teach people how to look at predictions. We can teach people how to understand that data to the watch might be delayed or missing and how to deal with that. The same way you deal with your CGM might give you an error message and it says wait up to three hours and data might come back. You know what to do in that time period. You can do the same thing if data is missing on your watch. You know, And so it's kind of like really, really baby steps of helping the regulators and helping the companies get to the stuff that patients actually need that on our own We've done a long time ago, but we really want to make it accessible and easy to everybody. So you don't have to DIY to get data on your watch or to get data on whatever phone platform that you want. I, I, more questions, I, but we won't keep you too long. To, um, back to, to the crew that's here. Do, any questions right now after we've been going around this for Dana before we move on? Yes, Seb, go right ahead. Yeah, so from understanding, there's a problem between, uh, uh, so companies, they're trying to be careful with patients so that they don't um, mess up their body somehow, but also there is the problem of uh, patients trying to hack stuff for themselves because the average doesn't really work. Um, and I was wondering whether maybe the middle, the point, the, the middle point for, would be some kind of... Um, way of not being uh, of being there as a functionality but maybe a bit hidden so that it can be discussed with maybe experts in some kind of way before people just <laughs> mess up stuff i don't yeah. know yeah no that's that's always been my pitch to commercial companies of you have the basic works for everybody front and center have a secret engineering super patient menu whatever you want to call it but give me the ability to turn on the prediction give me the ability to you know change these settings um but that concept doesn't really exist in diabetes devices. It's, you know, got to work for everybody one way, one method, one set of profiles. And so maybe we'll get there. And if, you know, you have the same idea that I do, like, this is a way to, there's, there can be an in-between on this device. Maybe the companies will get there, but please take that idea and keep sharing that with diabetes companies and with all healthcare devices. Cause this idea of one device really working for everybody usually means that it's not working great for most people. And so I think there's got to be that kind of in-between type solution that's got the separate mode, that menu that you can opt into to get more customization, more complexity, you know, prove it with training, prove it with education, sure, but something that enables you to do more. I would love that. Yeah, sounds, sounds like a reasonable approach. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Fantastic. Anybody else right now? Okay, I'm going to jump in with a cynical question and Dana Riffin on that last point. Is that it's not just the biomedical device, health device, um, FDA approved things that hog the data. And, you know, I, you mentioned the phone. I can look at the how difficult it is to get data. It's not impossible because there are hacks, but it is a hack to get uh, health, so-called health data off an Apple phone. Maybe it's different on Android. There are devices that, uh, you know, that don't really have a, a medical case for security ketone breath analyzer, you can't get the data off them. Some, some of the blood glucose ketone hybrids you can, but again, it seems like whose interest is it to keep this data? I don't think it's just because they're taking care of you. I don't know mega corporations that, that you know, pharma does very well. You mentioned COVID in taking care of us with certain solutions, but they also make a whole whack of money. So how, do you know what they do with all that data that they go secret squirrel with about, about <laughs> everybody who's giving it to them? I don't know what they do with the data, but I mean, okay. your example of blood glucose meters, I, I think the premise behind this is until they can figure out how to financially 
model a way to get paid for adding the new features. They stick to the status quo, which is keep your data mm. on your device, keep it to the company. Um, mm -hmm. It's in the best inter financial interest of the company to keep the data. I, yeah. from my understanding, and this may be a naive perspective on that, that feels to me about why it is the way it is. And so on the one hand, I'm like, yeah, let's figure out how to commercialize this because I want to freaking free my data and get my data where I want it to go. But I also think it comes back to when I when I say like, if I would give you buckets of money to pay for this, it then comes back to control and this perception, especially with health data of who is in charge, who will see the information. What if you do something with the data? Like that's the whole freaking point of right testing your blood mm. ketones mm. or your breath ketones or your blood glucose. Mm. You want mm. to know to potentially in concert with other information and knowledge, potentially take action. Or maybe it's just like, I want to log the data point, but it should be mm -hmm. up to you. It should be your right to decide what you do with an individual or a trend line. But mm -hmm. despite being in the U.S. for many of us, that just that culture is still very much we must control and decide here's what you can do. Anything else is just not allowed. And so that's like a big cultural thing for healthcare companies, regulators, not just the U.S., but, you know, in, in Europe, too, with CE marking and stuff. It's very much about we must define exactly what the use case is. Anything else is just not allowed. And if we find out a companies are allowing that, they'll get in trouble. If it's inadvertent use, we'll just tell them to shut it down. They won't get in trouble. But it's very much don't allow people to do other things because we haven't tested. We haven't proven that it works. Even if by So how did anybody people, hack into the device to get the data off it to begin with and not be shot? <laughs> um, the other analogy I like to think about is it, there's an RCT on parachute use that basically says mm -hmm. no RCTs have been done because parachutes <laughs> save lives. Nobody's going to jump out of a plane without a, a parachute. Um, right. and, and the same thing I think happens in healthcare where the things that work, they work really, really well. There starts to be research on them. Um, eventually there'll be RCTs on them. Like we have an RCT right now going on with the open source version. Data will mm -hmm. be out next year. Um, so there's there's studies and stuff that proves that it works, but again, it comes back to control and who's allowed to bring solutions to the market and what it looks yeah. like and who's paying for yeah. it and all that kind of stuff. But the question of like who is figuring out how these devices work, it's people who are very deeply motivated to understand how their device works. Ben West, who I mentioned, he's the one who spent yeah. years before we had a dream of closing the loop. He's like, I how do I know that when I send a command to my pump from a remote? that it's actually getting that information. How do I know, how do I validate right. that it's doing what I say it's doing? Right. So it was like a trust question to him. How do I learn to trust this yeah. device that says it's doing this thing? Yeah. So he had this big question around trust for just regular diabetes management. In the process, learned about the radio communications of the pump, documented it, and that's the framework we use to close the loop. With the CGM, it was very much, again, a practical problem of I need to get my data for John, for his son. I need to get my son's data off so I can see it because I can't go to kindergarten with him. I need him to be able to be at kindergarten with his device and me to be able to see his data remotely. And what's kind of interesting is early on when there was this big movement around remote diabetes monitoring, there's an open source platform called Night Scout, which is used with OpenAPS as well. Um, the company, the CEO of that CGM company called people rogue cowboys and helicopter parents for wanting to see their blood sugar data of their child when they were apart. And that to me is just an example of somebody who doesn't understand what it's like. If he was a parent of a kid with diabetes, you know, he could maybe say, I think most parents do whatever, but like, he's not a parent of a kid with diabetes, doesn't have diabetes. And so for him to make this kind of really judgmental negative comment about people trying to solve their own problems or, you know, really common problem of parents with kids. Well, guess what? Now in the latest commercial versions, there is a share and follow feature where you can remotely see it. Um, so it took, tens of thousands of people doing this for them to see the business opportunity of, oh, this is going to be a market differentiator. We're going to do it. So there was a commercial reason that they ultimately decided to do some of what the DIY community had figured out. That's, that's great. I think we've got one last question. And then, and then so uh, Dushani, why don't you come on and ask your question? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, hi, thank you very much. It was really, really interesting. So I just wanted to ask, um, you mentioned about customization and personalization of interventions. Um, I was wondering whether there are any mechanisms that you would suggest to gather ideas about um, how we can actually approach a person's attention um, with a suitable intervention. For example, uh, you spoke about visualizing predictions. Um, so. Or how can we actually come up with um, 
a proper visualization mechanism which will grab a person's attention? Are there any mechanisms we can um, use to approach that? Yeah, that's a really great question. I don't have a really simple, straightforward answer. Um, what I will say is that I think one of the challenges with predictions is how much of the input data do you display to people? Is it a summary? Is it, you know, that that graph of what's been happening with all the different data stacked on top and then showing the predictions? Are you trying to educate people about what goes into the predictions? Are you just trying to like make all that really complex information just simple and straightforward? I think that context between the input and the output of input and, per and predictions kind of depends on the context and depends on what your use case is. So to be able to answer your question in a little more detail, I still probably wouldn't have a good answer, but it would be kind of, it depends on, you know, what are you trying to predict? What is the point of the prediction? Is the prediction to simplify all the input stuff? But is there a need to be able to toggle on and off the ability to show those input variables? Um, I can show a, I can post a screenshot into Slack later showing you what my Night Scout screen looks like in more detail, where you can see the blood sugar data, the changes in insulin, any food that's been on there, and then you see the purple prediction line of here's what's going to happen um, mm -hmm. in the future. And so most of the time, all I have to do is look at that purple prediction line. But if I have a question about it, I can very easily glance left and see all of the data that goes into it and kind of use that to contextualize the prediction. Um, so it kind of depends on what are you using the prediction for? How often is it going to be used? Is it educational? Are you trying to teach people more about the input variables? Are you trying to prevent them from having to look at the input variables? So kind of a, a very big, it depends, but that is a fantastic question. And I like the way that you're thinking about it. Because I think those are the kinds of things we need to be thinking about in terms of design or adding on components like predictions to medical devices. And something I didn't mention today, but one of my big advocacy pushes is diabetes is a very data-driven disease. We had blood sugar meters, thankfully, by the time I was diagnosed, and, and now CGM. So we, we're used to treating people with data, but there's probably lots of other health conditions, cystic fibrosis, asthma, many other things where you have regular treatments or intervention treatments where the data is kind of just not gathered or not tracked anywhere that's visible to the patient. So if we start thinking about how do we take the same concept of how do we capture the data that exists for treatments or for prevention, and then what kind of predictions are useful from there for the end user or for the clinician that should go in the EMR and things like that. I think that's where you're going to start to get really cool innovations in healthcare is looking at these other conditions that aren't necessarily seen as data-driven, but absolutely could and should be as data-driven as diabetes is today. But that's kind of like diabetes in the 1970s. People might do something wrong if we actually capture this data. Well, let's start capturing the data and let's partner with patients and figure out what problems they want to solve. And then we can start to answer these questions about what should we predict? How do we customize them, et cetera? But I would say like pick a small problem, start there, start collecting the data on something and then keep asking the questions about how do you build predictions? How do you do the customization? And I think you're in, that's like a great process. Well, on that happy, happy note, let's let's wrap it up for tonight. And my, I think everybody is here is, is just thrilled with the presentation to thank you very much for that. And really look forward to part two as well. Josh Andres will be our Australia liaison host for that time zone shift. And we'll look forward to catching up with you on Slack. I got one more question about food logging, but I'll put it there. All right. Sounds great. Thank you very, very much all. And we'll see y'all uh, again for the next one very, very soon. Thank you, Dana. Great meeting you. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.